Um, thanks for the intro. Like he said, my name is Peter, and I'm working on the PowerBuoy project. So let's get right into it. The PowerBuoy project, um, if anyone doesn't know what it is, it is animated right here. It's composed of three parts, the buoy, the power takeoff unit, and the plate. I will be referring to this as the PTO for short. So the way it works is the buoy moves with the waves. The plate, which is so large and so deep, does not move, and this relative motion is captured by the PTO and turned into electrical power. How does it do that? So there is a pneumatic spring inside. Uh, this spring is compressed and elongated. That movement moves a piston, which turns a motor, turns a generator. Uh, that is, uh, which creates electricity, and then it goes through power conversion and stored into batteries, which is on top of the uh, buoy here. My uh, contribution to this project uh, is really in two parts. One is we have um, the submerged plate. This uh, distance is about 55 meters, so it's pretty deep underwater. Uh, my contribution is one, it's underwater, how do we get it back? And two, is it as um, still as we want it to be? So since both of my projects uh, deal with the plate, let's look at the plate. It is made out of um, steel. It, uh, there are two rectangular tubes, I'm sorry, two square tubes, and then six rectangular tubes laid across it. Uh, it's welded together. It's all one solid piece. It weighs about 2,100 pounds. Uh, and notice the gaps here. We will be getting back to that. But first, let's talk about recoverability. Before we can talk about recoverability, we have to talk about deployment. Uh, where do we put this thing? Uh, this is our uh, deployment location, it changes every time we deploy it. Uh, here's Ambari here as a reference. How do we get it there? This is our uh, deployment recovery vessel, the Sean Array, uh, captained by Jim Chrismond. It is a uh, converted fishing vessel. It has the A-frame and various winches and whatnot that allow us to move the power buoy into the water. Uh, this is just a nice picture to show you the scope of the project how big it is and what we're dealing with. Uh, this is just getting it into the water. So once we get it into the water, the buoy itself and the PTO are towed from the boat, which would be over here. And the plate is stored on the boat uh, attached to the A-frame. So once we submerge it, OK, and here's some uh, pictures of the conditions that we uh, deploy in. As you can see, it can be quite calm or not quite so calm. Uh, notice this little orange float in each picture. Uh, if anyone's wondering what that is, this is our current plate recovery system. There is a line attached to this float that goes all the way to the plate, and when we want to get it back, we uh, park up next to it, grab the line, pull it back up. So the line, the recovery line is deployed for the entire duration of the deployment. You can see um, problems that could arise with this. The deployment or the recovery line could get tangled around the PTO or it could snap and get lost entirely as it did in our last deployment. So um, we need to come up with a better system for getting the plate back. Uh, it turns out that a lot of people, this is not a common problem, a lot of people put stuff underwater and they always want it back. So Benthos is a company that uh, invented the pop-up buoy, which is shown here. It is an acoustically trivial acoustically tr triggered uh, recovery system. And it looks, it's battery powered, and it looks something like this. It has two distinct parts. This is, shaft right here is the acoustic release. There's the uh, antenna on top. Around it is a syntactic foam collar. It does not crush under depth, and this whole part floats to the surface. And then tied to it is your recovery line, which is coiled into the rope canister. Rope canister is attached to the um, whatever submerged, in our case, the plate. So these two things lock together, and then you send the signal. The top half floats up, carrying the uh, rope with it, and recovery is a lot easier. So how do these things lock together? Uh, in the rope canister, there is a lip, and on the end of the mechanical, uh, the uh, acoustic release, there is a latch, and those things hook into each other and then you send the acoustic signal. This rotates, there's a uh, motor inside, and they detach and it floats up and brings the rope with it. So how do we get the signal 
to uh, our submerged power or our submerged pop-up buoy. This is the uh, acoustic unit. This uh, generates the signal, and we can control the frequency of the signal. And this is the transducer. This goes in the water and uh, uh, sends a signal out for the pop-up buoy to receive. So um, we already owned some of these, luckily enough. So they were in storage in Castroville. So we went and got them, uh, washed them because they were really dirty, and tested them to make sure that they still work. So we have a little nice little video, thanks to Donsick, uh, of me testing them. You can see the deck unit and the transducer in the water. That sound, that terrible, terrible sound, is the acoustic signal. Our papa buoy is in the bottom of our test tank, and you can see it float up. There it is, right there. Boom. Easy. OK. Um, so I had to make some modifications to this to make it applicable for our system. Because our uh, plate is so heavy, we need thicker rope. Thicker rope means we need a bigger canister. So I made some bigger canisters. We had four in storage. I uh, modified two of them because we don't want to just have one recovery system. We want to have a backup on the plate in case one doesn't work for whatever reason. So that is part one. Part two is making sure that this plate isn't moving, like it isn't moving in this uh, animation. So we have this handy dandy an animation one more time. Uh, during deployment, we have some instrumentation that uh, collects the data. On this buoy, we have an IMU, which uh, records the acceleration from which we can uh, get the motion of the buoy. And inside the PTO, we have a string potentiometer, which measures the stroke of the piston. And we know that the difference between the movement of the buoy and the movement of the piston is the movement of the plate, which is graphed here. As you can see, it's not as still as we would like it to be. Um, this is data, this is one hour's worth of data from a particularly choppy day. And you can see that um, from peak to peak amplitude, we have about a meter of movement of this plate, which is uh, not what we want. This is uh, the same data. I just zoomed in on the first minute because that last graph is a little too much noise. So you can see, even over the course of a minute, how much this plate is moving up and down. So how do we fix this? Uh, there are two solutions. One is that we put it deeper underwater, which we have been doing. The second is to increase the surface area and the uh, coefficient of drag of this plate. So this is the plate before, and my solution is to fill in these gaps, fill in plates. So um, when, uh, when designing these fill in plates, there's a lot of considerations to make. Uh, obviously, we want it to be as light as possible. Uh, as far as the dimensions are concerned, it has to fill in the gaps. But by how much do we want to overlap? Uh, how thick is it going to be? That's going to influence the weight. What is it going to be made out of, of course, influences the weight. Uh, where are we going to put it on the submerged plate? We can put it on top or underneath. And how are we going to attach it? Uh, welding, which is obviously permanent, and bolts, which is, um, allows to be taken on and off for modifications if necessary. So uh, all of these conditions, some are more optimal than other. I did a phys 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 feasibility test on it uh, to make sure uh, that uh, under the applied load, it wouldn't fail. Um, so these are the conditions that I found optimal. Uh, these are as light as possible while still being within our safety factor. So the um, plate as a whole should be able to withstand uh, 10,000 pounds of force because one fill-in plate is about 3% of that area. The applied load to any one plate is about 300 pounds. Uh, this is a SOLIDWORKS simulation. Uh, you can see the little arrows are my applied load. And um, this is the resulting, uh, this is our result. Obviously, this is an exaggeration. This doesn't actually happen to the plate, or we would definitely have some problems. So you can see that our max stress is about 410 PSI, and our yield strength is about 40,000. So we're well within our safety factor. So the next thing to consider is how these fill-in plates will affect the plate, the submerged plate as a whole. This is, uh, again, a SOLIDWORKS simulation with and without the plates. Again, it's uh, exaggerated. This doesn't actually happen. 
we have in our applied load of 10,000 pounds, and these are um, the maximum displacements. Without the plates, the maximum displacement is about two tenths of an inch, and with the plates, it's about four tenths of an inch, uh, which is also within our range of safety. So uh, it's safe to do, and we need to build it. So next is uh, fill in plate fabrication. This is simple enough. We ordered the pieces, uh, cut to size. I drilled all the holes myself. And once I had that done, uh, we were ready to test it. So in order to test it, what we did is hung it from a crane, put it in the test tank. Um, this is just a block diagram. Uh, we had a hydraulic ram at a 72 inch stroke. So this moves up and down, and which moves the plate up and down. And we are able to record the movement with a string potentiometer and the forces that it undergoes with a load cell. Here are some pictures of our experimental setup. Uh, you can see the crane, this is our hydraulic ram, and then the plate underwater. And uh, this is another angle of the same thing. This is the HPU, and on the bridge here we have our accumulator and valve. These uh, control the hydraulics to the hydraulic ram. Right there is the DATAC that records the data from the string pot and the load cell. And uh, there's me. So here we have a nice video, thanks to Todd, of that test. So this is our load cell, and that's our string potentiometer. We're starting from the top. This is our crane. Uh, this is the top of our hydraulic ram. Uh, pan down the ram. That's where the hydraulic fluid enters. This is the piston, which moves up and down. You can see it moving up right now. And this is our tether, which goes into the... So you can see the plate moving up and down. And sinusoidal motion. OK, I'm going to skip forward. So some math. Um, this is our free body diagram. This is what the plate. This is the plate. These are the forces that it... Uh, uh, it undergoes the FFT is the force from the hydraulic ram. Uh, buoyancy force is what it experiences from being underwater. Gravitational force is what it experiences from being on Earth. And drag force is what it experiences from moving up and down through the water. Uh, those forces are given here. This is what we know, density of water, gravity, mass of the plate, area of the plate, volume of the plate. This is what we measured, the force that is acting on it, and its movement. Uh, we know that sum of all forces is equal to mass times acceleration. Thank you, Isaac Newton. Uh, this is our sum of forces, these two minus these two. And uh, one thing to note here, the mass is not just the mass of the plate, but also the uh, mass of the water that sits on top of the plate that it is responsible for moving. So we can combine all this into one nice equation with two unknowns, the mass of the water on top and the coefficient of drag. Since we uh, collected data every tenth of a second, we actually have the hundreds of equations and two unknowns. So these unknowns are solved for. And using MATLAB and a least squares fit, we can solve for mu and CD, which we did. So these are our results. With the, without the plates and then with the plates, uh, you can see that our CD uh, coefficient of drag was 6.8. Now it's 8.4. And the mass of the water on top was about uh, 5,000 kilograms. Now it's 20,000 kilograms. So both of those went up as per expected. Uh, and then what we did is took those numbers, plugged them back in to that equation, and plotted the estimated versus the measured to make sure that they lined up. And sure enough, the blue and green lines match up, which means my numbers are correct, which is good. So in conclusion, uh, both parts of my project were a success. They are ready to go for the next deployment. Unfortunately, they weren't ready for the deployment that I was part of. So this is it before, that's it after. Uh, special thanks to my mentors, Francois and Andy. Francois, I had 10 questions every hour. You had answers to all of them. Uh, Andy, I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for you. George and Linda, uh, thank you for this amazing opportunity uh, and making this internship possible. Johnny, Frank, Larry, and Jim helped me build everything. Uh, Jake helped me with the uh, pop-up buoys and the acoustics. Paolo helped me doing the SOLIDWORKS simulation, and Rob was instrumental in the MATLAB simulation. So that's thanks to everyone, uh, and that's it. Any questions?